All right, good morning. Let me, first of all, say thank you to you for your work through the cooperative program. I know you think denominational folks are supposed to say that, and, and we are, but I want you to know, on behalf of our 4,800 missionaries that I get to work with at the IMB, our 3,200 students at uh, Southeastern Seminary, and in my IMB role, I get to work with all of our seminaries. I want you to know that I've had the privilege of seeing what God's doing in North America, what God's doing around the world, and it really is the case, as we saw that video earlier of, of a little guy just keeping his pennies. When we put it all together, I'm telling you, God is taking the work and the dollars and the sacrifice of Southern Baptist, and God is touching the world. Uh, and not just giving. You're giving to something that God is using in mighty ways. And so I want to thank you personally for your giving and for your prayers and for the opportunity to come and speak to you today. Well, we're talking about spiritual warfare and prayer. Here's my title, Weakening and Dependence, God's Purpose for the Battle. Weakening and Dependence, God's Purpose for the Battle. Here's what I want to do in my time. I'm going to walk us from Genesis to Revelation, believe it or not, to look at what God's doing through the battle. In order to do that, we're going to have to move briskly. You need to get your Bible ready, get your pen ready, get your pencil ready. And let's take a look at what God's doing through the battle, weakening independence, God's purpose for the battle. What's God doing in spiritual conflict? Well, start with me in the book of Genesis, chapter 3. And we're just literally going to walk through some text and unpack these texts, let the text challenge us a little bit. And I pray, recognize our need to pray at the end of our session. At the end of our session together, we're going to pray together at our tables, and we're just going to seek the Lord's face. Genesis chapter 3, verse 14 is where we'll begin. This text, if you put it in context, is God's judgment on the serpent. Remember, the serpent has come to the garden. He's deceived Eve, and she's eaten. She gave some to her husband, and he ate too. Now, sin has entered the garden. It appears that the enemy has won, but that victory is temporary. So look with me at Genesis 3, 14 and 15. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Verse 15 then says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, if you're comfortable underlining in your scriptures, underline these words in verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman. I will put enmity between you and the woman. Here's what the text says. God says, I'm going to put enmity between the serpent and his seed and the woman and her seed. Now, if we look at this with the whole scripture in mind, here's what we know about this text. This text is the foreshadowing of someone coming. And who is that someone? It is, tell me. It's Jesus. So here's God saying, God saying to the serpent, I'm going to send someone from the seed of the woman who is going to crush your head. He is going to step on your head even as he is wounded in the process. And so this text, while it sounds like it's just God's judgment on the serpent, and it is indeed that, it is much more than that. This text is not just judgment on the serpent. It is God's victory cry. It's God's word to the serpent. You have messed up this garden, but you're not going to win. Because I'm going to send someone who is going to crush your head. Yes, you'll wound him, but it is through his death that Jesus will conquer the enemy. That's good news for us, yes? From the garden said, I've already won this battle. I've already won this battle. But I want you to look specifically at the text. The text says, I will put enmity. That little word enmity there means struggle. It means conflict. It means hostility. It means battle. So look at the text closely again. God said, I'm going to put this conflict between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. I'm going to put a conflict between human beings and the enemy. So if that's the case, tell me what this text says. Why do we have spiritual warfare? What's the text say? God says, I will put 
enmity there. You know why we have spiritual warfare? Because God put it there. That's what the text tells us. God put it there. So we have to think through then today, well, if God put it there, is God always right? Yes or no? Yeah, He's always right. Does God know exactly what He's doing? Yes. Does God always have a plan? Yes. So we have to begin to ask the question, well, what's God up to? What is God up to as He creates this conflict? If He says, I'll put this conflict here, well, what's He up to? Well, here's what God knows. This conflict is going to lead directly to the cross. That conflict is going to lead directly to Calvary, where the enemy surely delighted when Jesus died, when Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it looks like at the cross the enemy has won. But here's what you and I know this side of the cross. It is through Jesus' death that he disarmed the powers. It's through his death that he broke the back of the enemy. So we need to capture that for a minute. Jesus defeated the enemy by his death. He defeated the enemy not by his strength, but what appears to be his weakness. God said, I'm going to put the conflict there. Because he knows it is that conflict that will lead directly to the place where Jesus will purchase our salvation, where Jesus dies for us. But then we also have to ask, why do we have conflict this side of the cross? And that's what we'll unpack as we talk together today. Here's what I want you to see from this text. Let me just give you some summary statements here. First of all, summary statement from Genesis 3 is this. God put the conflict in place. God put it there. Now, what we'll see, if we can look at this all day long, what we'll see is there are times when you and I are in spiritual conflict because we just do dumb things. True? Yeah, sometimes we find ourselves in spiritual conflict because we cross the sin line and we follow the enemy and we pay the price for our choices. Sometimes we're just there because we choose to follow the enemy's way. But you know what? There are other times when we're in spiritual conflict simply because we are walking in the center of God's will. True? There are times we're in spiritual battle just because we're walking where God wants us to walk. And the text says God put it there. There must be a reason for this. Let me give you another summary statement from Genesis 3. Spiritual warfare is not defensive. We're not on the defensive as followers of Jesus Christ. We are on the offensive. The whole picture of Genesis 3.15 is that when the world is in chaos and the world will be destroyed because of sin and even nature itself will get disrupted and we will all die because of our sin, God said this, I'm going to step into the story. I'm going to come. I'm going to send my son. I'm not going to make it so that you have to climb the ladder back to me. I'm going to come to you. And God initiates this when he sends his son and Jesus takes on flesh and Jesus comes to the world to defeat the enemy. And that's at God's initiative. And that is absolutely fundamentally on the offensive. You and I as God's church, here's our calling. It is to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. True? It's to take the gospel to every people group in the world. And here's, here's what the Bible says about the people we're called to reach, our neighbors and the nations. Here's their status. Ephesians chapter 2 says that they are following the prince of the power of the air. Colossians 1 verse 13 says they are in the domain of darkness. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4, those verses say that they are blinded by the God of this world. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 25 and 26, that text says that they are in the snare of the devil. Acts 26, verse 18, Jesus, when he called the apostle Paul, said that they are in the devil's kingdom and they are in darkness. So here's the picture that the Bible paints about the people you and I are called to reach. In the devil's trap, following the enemy, following the prince of the power of the air, living in darkness and in the kingdom of the enemy. Whether we like it or not, that's their state. So you know what? When you and I are called to go to them 
and take the gospel to them, when you and I are called in to step into the darkness and take the light of the gospel there, we are absolutely not on the defensive. We are on the offensive. We're to put on the full armor of God, and we are to walk into the enemy's kingdom with the gospel. Here's what the enemy wants. He wants us to be frightened. He wants us to back off. He wants us to give up. Our calling is not to be on the defensive. It is on the offensive. And thus, we are called to incarnate the gospel. We are called to be the gospel to people in the devil's kingdom. But here's the good news. When you and I do that, we already know this. We're on the winning side. As God already said, I'm sending my son who's going to stomp on the enemy's head. So we're not on the defensive. We're on the offensive. We are to go. Our task is to engage the enemy. So we do it because God told us to do it. Your task is to reach Virginia, to help us reach North America, to help us reach the nations. All of that calling, all of that calling puts you smack in the center of spiritual warfare. Now, go with me to Exodus chapter 14. I want to walk you through some text here, and I want to give you a central truth to write down. We already talked about this reality. God put the battle in place. Let me give you a central truth to write down. God leads us into impossible battles. I'll give you a minute to write that down. God leads us into impossible battles. That he might be our warrior. God leads us into impossible battles. That he might be our warrior. And the nations might know his name. God leads us into impossible battles so that he might be our warrior and the nations might know his name. You don't have to answer this question for me. You don't need to raise your hand here, but I wonder how many of you today find yourself in a situation, in a battle, in a conflict, in hostility, and it seems just impossible. Again, you don't have to raise your hand. I can see on your faces. For some of you, that's reality today. God leads us into impossible battles that he might be our warrior and the nations might know his name. Go with me to Exodus chapter 14. Let's pick up in verse 12. Here's the scenario. Moses is leading his people. They have now fled Egypt. They've come to the Red Sea. And here's the picture. There's a sea in front of them and the Egyptian army pursuing them, the most powerful army in the world coming after them. The, the sea in front of them, they've never seen water split before. They're alarmed at this. They're frustrated with Moses. Look at verse 12. Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And then look at verse 13. I want you to, I want you to hear this battle plan. Here's what their leader tells them to do. Verse 13. And Moses said to the people, fear not. Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. Then look at verse 14. Read it to me. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. So what's the battle plan? Tell me. What does he tell them to do? Somebody help me. Stand firm. All right, there's one. What else? Be silent. Don't be afraid. Let the Lord fight. Now think about that. You're a Hebrew. You can hear the Egyptian army coming. You can see them. You see this water in front of you. And here's what your leader says. First of all, don't be afraid. That in and of itself is ridiculous. Stand still. Be quiet. And see the salvation of the Lord. You know what? None of that makes sense to me. Not, not, a, not a bit of that makes sense to me. 
And from our human perspective, we would not typically take any of those steps. I think if you're like me, here's what we'd be doing. We'd be afraid, we'd be swimming, and we'd be screaming. All, all of those. Because here's what we do. We do our best to fix the problem and then later turn to God. We try to figure out how are we going to win this battle first, and then if we can't get across the water, we'll turn to God. It's not what Moses said. No, you stand still, don't worry, be quiet, and let God fight the battle for you. Well, you know what happens. God just divides the water. The Hebrews go across on dry ground. Go with me to verse 23. The Egyptians come after them. Look at what happens. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea. All Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watch, the Lord and the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, now watch this and underline these words if you're comfortable doing that. Let us flee from before Israel. Why? Look at the next phrase. For who? The Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Let's run from Israel because the Lord's fighting for them. Now tell me this. You know the, the story of Egypt. Did the Egyptians have their own gods? Yeah, they had all kinds of gods. They had a pantheon of gods. But what are they saying about those gods when they say, let's run from Israel because the Lord's fighting for them? Do you get what they're saying? Their Egyptian gods are useless here. So here's what the Egyptians say. We've got to run from this nation because their God is more powerful than any of our gods. And here's what happens. God leads his people to an impossible situation that he might be their warrior. And when they let him fight the battle and he rolls the water back and they go across on dry ground and the Egyptians pursue them and God clogs their wheels and they drown in that sea, they have to cry out, their God is mightier than our gods and the nations know the glory of God when he alone is the warrior. That's just one story. You take it to another one. Judges. Chapter 7. Judges chapter 7. It is one of the most obvious texts in the scriptures. This theme that God alone is our warrior. Sometimes we miss it. We pick up in chapter 7, verse 2. Gideon, his armies, ready to fight the Midianites. And the Lord has a word for them. And look at this word and think about it logically. Once again, it makes no sense. Verse 2, the Lord said to Gideon, the people with you are what? Underline those words, are too many. For me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Now therefore proclaim in the ears of the people, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Then 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. So what's the deal here? Gideon's got his armies lined up, 32,000 warriors there to go against the Midianites. And what does God say to him? Your army's too big. You got too many warriors on your side. Now think about that from our perspective. That is illogical, yes? When we go into war, when we go into battle, we don't think about fewer soldiers. We think about more soldiers, more people, more weapons. Why? Because we equate our strength with our numbers. God said you got too many, so anybody who's afraid, let him go home. 22,000 leave, 10,000 are left. The Lord's not done yet. Verse 4, and the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Take them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. And anyone of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, shall go with you. Anyone of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, shall not go. So God brings them down to the water, 
and he reduces the numbers to how many this time? Remember? 300. Think about that. If you're Gideon, you're, you're the leader. You got your armies lined up, 32,000 ready to go. God says, got too many? Reduce them. God looks again, you still got too many. Reduce them. Now you've got 300 warriors on your side. What did God say? Here's the deal, he said. If you win this battle with 32,000 warriors or you win this battle with 10,000 warriors, you're still too strong, and here's what you'll do. You will take the glory. And our God shares his glory with nobody. So he says to Gideon, I'm going to lead you into battle, but I'm going to lead you into an impossible situation. I'm going to give you 300 warriors. In fact, you read this rest of the story. Here's what he says. Here's, here's what I'm going to tell you to do. I'm going to take, you're going to take some pictures, and you're going to break them, and you're going to scream some things, and you're going to say, the sword of the Lord, and all these things. And you're going to run at them. You got torches, you got trumpets to blow, you got pictures to break. And it sounds like fiction to us. But here's what God said I'm going to win this battle for you. I'll be your warrior so the nations might know his glory. And the Midianites and the nations will learn that God's people with 300, God on their side, is mightier than any army with 32,000 warriors. What does God do? He leads us into impossible situations that he might be our warrior, that the nations might know his name. Go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17, you know this story. I'll wait a minute as you get to it. This is David and Goliath. First Samuel chapter 17, we're going to walk through this text. And I want you to see what the writer does, because this writer intentionally sets us up. He sets us up with two pictures. On one side of this picture is Goliath. On another side of this picture is David. And I want you to see how the writer sets up the impossibility here. For example, go with me to verse 4. He tells us the Philistines stand on one side of the mountain. Israel stands on the other side of the mountain. And verse 4 says this of 1 Samuel 17. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head. He was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. He had bronze armor on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield bearer went before him. All right, just stop there for a minute and look at this and think about this. How many times when you read through the Bible do you see this kind of depth in describing a person, his height, the weight of his armor, the weight of the, the head of his spear? We seldom get that detail. But we do in this story. The writer wants us to know, though there's some debate about how these measurements are, are calculated, it's likely this guy is nine feet, nine inches tall. He has armor that weighs 125 pounds. We're even told that the head of his spear weighs 15 pounds. This guy has a bowling ball on the end of his spear. Now, you tell me this. Why would the writer want us to have this detail? What does he want us to know about Goliath? It's pretty simple. This is one big dude right? And he could have just said that. He could have said, this is a giant. But he particularly wants us to know just how big he is. And it's no wonder nobody will take him on. The Israelite army stands in fear. Well, David will be introduced. Go with me to verse 14, same chapter. Listen to how David is introduced then. We're introduced to the sons of Jesse, and the text says, David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So what do we learn about David here? He's what? First of all, he's the youngest of Jesse's sons. In that culture, not likely the one to be the leader. And he's not a warrior. What is he? He is a, a shepherd. 
So now we're already introduced. We're introduced, first of all, to this giant named Goliath, nine feet, nine inches tall, fully armed. Now we're introduced to David, the shepherd boy, the young boy, the youngest of Jesse's sons. We can't even fathom from our human perspective that this young guy will take on this big guy. Doesn't make sense to us. Well, David can't figure out why nobody's fighting this giant. Because he's aware that God is on their side. He says, I'll go fight him. Go with me to verse 31, same chapter. Verse 31, when the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth. And he has been a man of war from his youth. Now, look at verse 33. What do we know about David again? He's but what? A youth. He's a boy. So when the second time we're told that he's just a youth, when you see that kind of repetition in the Scripture, the Scripture wants us to capture that. And what do we learn about this giant now? He's not only a warrior, but he's been a warrior how long? Since his youth. So now we've got this trained, armed, experienced warrior against David the shepherd boy, who we're told for the second time is only a boy. But look at verse 33 again. Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. Is Saul right about that? I, I see yeses and I hear noes. Is, is he right? You know what the answer is? Yes and no. So you got it right as a crowd. You got it right. On one hand, Saul's exactly right. David cannot go against this giant in his own power. And you know what, folks? Most of us, starting with me, we need to learn that there are an awful lot of things that we cannot do in our own power. So in that sense, Saul's right. On the other hand, he's wrong if David goes with God on his side. But remember what most of us do? Most of us fight the battle first and then turn to God. Well, David says, look, God's taking care of me with a bear, with a lion. He's going to take care of me now. Look at verse 38. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor. And he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Then he took a staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. What did Saul do for David? He put armor on him. Why? Why would he tell David, put some armor on? You know why? Because that's what you do if you're fighting from a human perspective. That's the logical thing to do. If you're going to take on this giant, look at him. He's fully armed. He's equipped. You better put some armor on. David tries it on. He takes it off. Then he comes after the giant, verse 41. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but what? A youth, a boy. There's the third time the writer wants us to know we've got a boy who's not wearing armor going against a giant who's fully armed. Verse 43. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David how? By his gods. So look, the giant is now called on his gods. Now we've got a Philistine and all of his gods against a shepherd boy and his god. That Philistine, all of his gods, they're about to learn they're nothing compared to David's god. Philistine said to David, verse 44, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, Listen to what this, this boy says. Listen to what he says to this armed giant. Let me just say to you, if you're about to say these words to an armed giant and you've just got some rocks and a sling and you're a shepherd boy, you better be really sure God's on your side. And he is. Look at what he says. You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, which means what? You're coming to me 
like human beings fight. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. Then look at this next line, underline it, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. God has led the shepherd boy to an impossible battle that God might be his warrior, that the nations might know his name. Verse 47, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear. See, he doesn't do it our way. For the battle is whose? And he will give you into our hand. That's the line we better hear. The battle is the Lord's. See, the God who has a purpose in the battle is the God who fights the battle for us. Our problem is we fight it on our own. Take you to another text. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. This is actually my favorite story like this in the Old Testament. Just walk through it quickly. Here's Jehoshaphat. He is the king. He gets word that there are three armies coming against the people of God. And so you've got this picture set up now. God's army, three armies coming after them. Three armies that are united now. That strikes fear in the king. He does the right thing. He calls his people to fasting and prayer, and they seek the face of God. And they emit these words in verse 12. Look at verse 12 as the king prays. One of my favorite prayers in the Old Testament. Oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. I love that text. Because it tells us exactly what we must do when we don't know what to do. And what is that? Lock our eyeballs on God who is our warrior. He says, we don't know what to do, so tell us what to do. Verse 15, Jehaziel gets a word from the Spirit of the Lord. And listen to this battle plan. And he said, listen, all Judah and heavens of Jerusalem, King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed at this great horde. For the battle is not yours, but whose? Tell me. It's God's. Tomorrow go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Z's. You will find them at the end of the valley, east of the wilderness of Jeruel. Now watch the plan here, the part A of the plan. You will not need to fight in this battle. Stand firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them and the Lord will be with you. So you tell me, three armies come against the people of God. What's the battle plan? Go out and do what? Nothing. Just go out there and stand because the battle is the Lord's. And look at this again. Look at verse 15 where the Lord says, Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. Then look at the latter part of verse 17 where the Lord says again, Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. Twice he says, don't be afraid and don't be dismayed. You know why he says it twice? Here's what I think. Because what he tells them to do in between that is ridiculous. Just go out there and stand. Don't be afraid. Go out there, just stand. Don't be afraid. It makes no sense to us because we fight first and turn to God second. But the battle is the Lord's. It's not ours. Verse 20. There's a second part of this battle plan. And they rose early in the morning and went into the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah and the heavens of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God and you will be established. Believe his prophets and you will succeed. And when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy attire. As they went before the army and say, Give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. So, he does send some people out, but whom does he send out? It's the choir. It's, it's the praise team. It's this band over here. He sends them out, and they start singing, Give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. Now, watch what happens, verse 22. If this weren't so tragic, it's almost comical. 
And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir. Those are the three armies that have come against the people of God, who had come against Judah, so that they were routed. For the men of Ammon and Moab rose against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, devoting them to destruction. So remember, we've got three armies. Two, now turn on the third and wipe out the third. And then keep reading. And when they had made an end to the inhabitants of Seir, they all helped to destroy one another. Now, don't, don't miss this. Watch what happens. Three armies come against the people of God. God says, go out there, just stand. I'll fight the battle for you. They send the choir out. They start singing, give thanks to the Lord. Two armies turn on the third. They wipe them out. Then the two armies left. They turn on each other. They wipe each other out. Meanwhile, the choir's singing, give thanks to the Lord. <laughs> now, you tell me, who gets the glory? It has to be God. Why? Because he's the warrior. God leads his people into an impossible battle that they cannot win, that he might be their warrior and the nations might know of his name. Look with me. Same chapter, verse 29. Verse 29. Look at the result of this. And the fear of God came on all the kingdoms of the countries when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. What happened? The nations heard. The nations heard. God leads us into impossible. But this God who puts conflict in the story in the first place is the God who fights the battle for us, is the God who leads us into impossible situations that he might be our warrior, that the nations might know his name. Now, go with me to the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. I believe Dr. Early is going to take us here later in the day, but let me just point out one text in verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Paul brings this letter together with this final image, this picture of the armor that we wear, but catch the focus of verse 10. Again, I invite you to underline your scriptures. Finally, be strong in whom? And in the strength of whose might? Put on the whole armor of whom? So tell me, whose armor is it that we wear? Whose strength is it that we fight in? Whose might is it that undergirds us? Whose battle is it? It's God's. God said, I will put enmity there. But God also said this, I'll fight the battle for you. And you bring it all the way through into Ephesians chapter 6, and here's what God says, I'm not only going to fight the battle for you, but I'm going to give you the armor to wear. And the armor you wear, it's not even your armor. It's my armor. So get all of this together. God has a plan for the conflict. God is the warrior who fights for us. God is the one who gives us his armor to wear. Meanwhile, what does the sun do for us? Hebrews chapter 7 tells us what. What is the sun doing for us even as we spend time here today? What's the sun doing for you? He's interceding for us. And what does the spirit do for us in those tough times when we don't even know how to pray? What does Romans 8 tell us? He makes intercession for us. Do you remember how? Always according to the will of the Father. So here's the picture. What's God doing? God has a plan in the battle. God has a purpose. God leads us into impossible situations that he might be our warrior, that the nations might know of his name. God gives us his armor. Meanwhile, the Son is interceding for us. Meanwhile, the Spirit takes up intercession for us when we don't know how to pray, groaning in ways that, that we don't understand, but always in accordance with the Father so that the Father's plan might be accomplished. And the Father's plan is this, that he will be our warrior in spiritual conflict, and you and I will be the vessels through whom the nations know of his glory. That's God's plan. So central truth number one is simply this. God leads us into impossible situations that he might be our warrior, that the nations might know of his name. Here's central truth number two. Central truth number two, most of us are too strong. 
most of us are too strong. Let me show you two texts here. First Chronicles chapter 21. Go back to the Old Testament with me. First Chronicles chapter 21. We go back to the story of David. And David is about to take a census of his people. Chapter 21, verse 1. I'll pause as I hear the pages turning. I want you to see the text with me. Verse 1, then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. So David said to Joab and the commanders of the army, Go, number Israel from Beersheba to Dan, and bring me a report that I may know their number. Now watch verse 3. Joab knows this isn't right. This is wrong. But Joab said, May the Lord add to his people a hundred times as many as they are. Are they not, my Lord, the king, all of them, my Lord's servants? Why then should my Lord require this? Why should it be a cause of guilt for Israel. So, for whatever reason, however it happens, Joab knows this is a problem. Verse 4, but the king's word prevailed against Joab. So Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came back to Jerusalem. Now, in verse 5, he gives his report, but I want you to see who gets reported here. And Joab gave the sum of the numbering of the people to David. And all Israel, there were 1,100,000 men who drew the sword, and in Judah, 470,000 who drew the sword. So, who gets reported? 1,100,000 men who draw the sword, 470,000 men who draw the sword. Who are they? They are, you tell me. It's the army. It's the warriors. So what does David want to know? He wants to know how strong he is. He wants to know how mighty he is. He wants to know how big his forces are. He wants to know how many warriors he's got on his side. And God is so displeased with this act that God plagues the entire nation. And it is a dramatic judgment for David's sin. What's the problem here? David wants to know just how mighty he is. But what does David know? Who's supposed to be his warrior? God is. Now tell me this. Why is this such a sin for David? Why is this such a problem for David in particular? You know why? David knows better. Why does he know better? Because he was David the shepherd boy once. Because there was a time in his life when all he knew to do was trust the Lord. And all he knew to do was to say, I'm going to go in the might of the Lord. And the Lord is my warrior. The battle is not mine. It's his. All he knew to do was if God said, take some rocks and a sling and go against the armed giant, you go because God said go. And he operated then in the strength and the might of the Lord. But watch what happens. Give him some position give him some experience, give him some power, give him some armies, and now what's happened? He's not dependent on God anymore. He's shifted all of his dependence to whom? To himself, and here's his problem. He's too strong. Now here's where that grabs me, and here's where that challenges me. I want every one of us in this room today to think about this question. Are we more like David the shepherd or David the king? I want you to think about where you really are. I want you to be reminded of those days. Remember those days as a new believer or a new pastor or a new church leader? You remember the days when you had no clue what you were doing? And you get up there and you'd have to pray your guts out because you knew if it happened, God had to do it. You remember? You remember when you stepped into the pulpit and your heart is pounding God, please just use me. You finish the sermon and you sit down and you collapse because you've had to lay everything at the feet of God and hope you get through it. Remember? Remember you prayed every week, God, please just show us how to do church. 
Remember when you prayed for your neighbors and you prayed for the nations because your heart was absolutely broken over lostness? Remember when you would tell that wall about Jesus? Do you remember when, do you remember when you were the shepherd boy or the shepherd girl? But here's what happens for far too many of us. Give us some experience, give us some training, give us some knowledge, give us some authority, give us some position, give us some people who report to us, and we become David the king. And you know what? We're too strong. I'm an educator by by calling. I love what I do in training students. I love my time training our missionaries. I believe in what we're doing in education. I believe, particularly in North America, we have such access to education. We need to take advantage of that. So I believe in that completely. I'm so grateful that through your giving through the cooperative program, you're helping to pay tuition for our students because I want our students to be absolutely fully equipped to go to the ends of the earth. But I'll tell you what, I fear every day that we're going to educate our students out of dependence on God. And I fear every day that they'll, that they'll come to us as David the shepherd boy and they'll go out as David the king. We don't need any more David the kings. We need David the shepherd boys. We need men and women who recognize, I'm too strong. God, do something. Let me give you another example. Mark, chapter 9. Mark, chapter 9. Mark, chapter 9, there are two stories juxtaposed against one another, the story of the transfiguration. You remember the story? Jesus takes some of his apostles up to the mountain. Luke tells us, by the way, they go up to the mountain to pray. So they go up there for the purpose of praying. And God just shows up. God the Father speaks. Moses and Elijah show up. Peter says, Master, it's good for us to be here. And you want to say, no kidding, Peter. Because, because God's moving here in a mighty way. So says, let's build some tabernacles. Well, meanwhile, at the foot of the mountain, the disciples are trying to cast out a demon, and they can't do it. You remember this boy? He's being thrown to the ground. He's foaming at the mouth. He's rolling about. The disciples try to cast him out, and the text says they could not do it. The father of this boy struggles with faith, and no wonder Jesus' disciples themselves lacked power. No wonder he struggled. He said, I believe, but help my unbelief. The disciples, look with me at verse 28. Jesus cast the demon out. Verse 28, and when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. And some versions read, and fasting. But prayer is really the focus here. They said, teacher, tell me why we couldn't cast the demon out. And here's what he said. You can't cast out a demon unless you pray. Which means they were trying to cast out a demon without doing what? Without praying. Well, tell me, why would, you, why would you try to take on a demon without praying? If someone went into a demonic manifestation in front of us, I think we would pray. Yes? Now, we may pray as we're going out the door or turning. I don't know what we'll do, but I think we'll pray. Tell me why these disciples would be trying to take on a demon without praying. You know why? Because they had been able to cast out demons before. They'd been on a journey before. They'd gone out and they'd cast out demons and they'd healed the sick. They'd proclaimed the gospel and God used them. This bunch of nobodies, this bunch of knuckleheads that sometimes didn't listen, that always argued over who was the greatest in the kingdom, God used them. So before they had power, they assumed today they can do it. And here's their problem. They're facing today's battle on the basis of yesterday's power. They're fighting today's battle on the basis of yesterday's power. And here's what they think. Because we could do it yesterday, we must be able to do it today. They think too highly of themselves. In fact, you keep reading in Mark chapter 9, just, just after this story, 
they're, after they failed miserably taking on this demon, you read the next part of the chapter, they're arguing among themselves who's the greatest in the kingdom. So they're caught in themselves. Here's their problem. They're too strong today. Depending on self, and they have to come to the end of themselves to recognize you can't do this apart from prayer and the power of God. See, here's, our, here's part of our problem as we try to reach our state, the nation, North America, the world. Part of our problem is this. We can do most of what we do in our own power. I'm going to say that again. We can do most of what we do in our own power. Yes or no? The truth is, we can play the game. We can do the work. The fact is, sometimes we can convince people to join our church and still lack the power of God. Far too many of us are facing today's battles on the basis of yesterday's power. We're David the king, hoping God will bless us like he did David the shepherd boy. Most of us are too strong. Let me go to a final truth. A final central truth. God uses the battle to weaken us. God uses the battle to weaken us. To bring us back to dependence on Him. Let me show you a couple texts. Go with me to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. If you can't find Job, go to the book of Psalms and back up. You'll find it right there. Job chapter 1. God uses the battle to win. What's God doing? God said, I'll put enmity there. He put it there that it would lead to the cross where Jesus broke the back of the enemy. But he did so not in his strength. He did so in his weakness. He brought life to us by his death. God is to be our warrior. Our problem is most of us are too strong. God uses the battle to weaken us, to bring us to dependence. Look at me at Job chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. So is this a good guy? Yes. Verse 6, same chapter. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? So, catch this. Who is it that brings up Job's name? It's God. It's not Satan. It's God who puts the bullseye on Job's back. Job who is righteous, who fears God, who turns from evil. Our world would say if he's walking with God like that, the blessings ought to just come out of heaven. But God says, if you consider my servant Job, and remember what Satan says, he's following you only because you're, you're giving him stuff. You remember, Satan says, don't, isn't there a hedge there? You're protecting him with a hedge. Now, don't, don't miss that. Satan knows there's a hedge there. He knows he can only go so far. He can never go any farther than God will allow. God says, I'm going to take the hedge down a little bit. You just can't hurt Job. And you remember what happens. Job loses everything except a wife who becomes briefly problematic in the next chapter. <laughs> but watch what he does. Look at verse 20. Look at what he does. Remember, this is a righteous man. He loses everything. Look at what he does. Then Job arose, this is verse 20, and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground, and he did what? He worshiped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. You know what, folks? I don't get this. 
I lost everything. Would I still worship? I hope so, but I don't know. See, here's what Job shows us. Victory in spiritual warfare is not escaping the battle. It's trusting God through the battle. It's trusting God in the battle. It's trusting the God who put the conflict into creation in the first place. This God who is our warrior. This God who gives us his armor. This God who intercedes for us. This Trinitarian God who is on our side. It's trusting that God has a reason. And here's what Job will be reminded of. God will say to him, look, Job, were you there when I made the waters? Were you there when I made the, the, the wind? Job, this righteous, godly man, has to be reminded. He's still not God. There's only one God. And even righteous people, God loves us enough God loves us enough to use the battle to weaken us that we stay David the shepherd boy. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Second Corinthians chapter 12. This is the story of the Apostle Paul. The first part of this chapter, he talks about a time when he was taken up into the heavens and he saw things he couldn't even speak of. He speaks of them in the third person even. And in verse 7, he says this. I, I had these great revelations. And I was given this messenger of Satan to keep me from getting arrogant. Verse 7, 2 Corinthians 12. So to keep me from being too elated by the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of whom? Satan, to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Now, stop there for a minute. Here's what Paul says. I was given this messenger of whom? Tell me again. It's from Satan. So is he in spiritual conflict? Yes. His job is to beat him up, to harass him, to buffet him. But he's given the thorn for what reason? To keep him from getting arrogant, to keep him from being too strong. Well, who would want to keep him from being too strong? Would the devil want to keep Paul from getting arrogant? No, the devil wanted him to get arrogant, to be David the king. So who is it that's keeping Paul humble? It's God. What do we have here? Here's what we've got. We've got a very clear picture of God allowing spiritual conflict. God's putting Paul directly in the center of an intense battle that God might be his warrior and that, Dave, or that Paul might recognize that he better not become David the king. Paul, this extraordinary apostle, called of God in a dramatic way, used of God. How tempting it must have been to think he was something. And God said, I'm not going to let you go there. He put him in spiritual conflict. Here's what Paul did. He did what you and I would do. Verse 8. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. So he prays. He prays, God, take it away. What's God's answer? Verse 9, my grace is sufficient for you, for if power is made perfect in what? Weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my what? Weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. Now, read the next line with me. For when I am weak, then I am. All right, listen to me. None of this makes sense. Paul says, my power is made perfect in weakness. We don't talk about power and weakness in the same sentence. He said, I'd rather boast about my weaknesses. We don't boast about our weaknesses. We boast about our strengths. Here's what Paul says. God put me in this battle. And he did so, so that I would learn this. I can be most used by God, not when I'm strong, but when I'm what? When I'm weak. Not when I'm David the king, but when I'm David the shepherd boy. And God loves Paul so much and wants to use Paul so much to reach the nations that he puts him in this conflict and he will not let him out. Paul comes to the point to say, you know what, I'm content. 
I'm okay because God's got a plan. You see, listen to me. We can be witnesses to the world when we're on the mountaintop and everything's going well. And God can use us then. But I'm telling you that our witness is often strongest when we are going through the valley and the enemy is pounding away at us and we trust God anyway. And the world says, I don't get why you're content. I don't get why you still have joy. I don't understand how you can still lift your hand and praise us to that kind of God. But when we do, the world takes note. When God is our warrior, here's our problem though, folks. Most of us are too strong. God allows the enemy sometimes to pound away at us to remind us that we better be David the shepherd boy. But then here's the victory. Go with me. One final text. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, beginning at verse 7. Revelation 12, verse 7. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but here's the good news, folks. He was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. Now look at verse 11. And they have conquered him by what? Look at this. By the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto what? Death. Some found victory. You know how they found victory? The text says, first of all, they found victory through the blood of the Lamb. You and I, the enemy is defeated because of the blood of the Lamb. We need to sing again, victory in Jesus. Because the blood has been spilt for us and you and I are on the winning side. Through the blood of the Lamb. Through the word of their testimony. They were willing to speak. That's our calling. We are to engage the enemy. We are to offensively go against the enemy by speaking the gospel. That's what they were willing to do. And then the text says this again. Look at it one more time. For they love not their lives even unto death. They died. God put them in a battle that would bring them to absolute dependence and absolute brokenness to the point that from the world's eyes it must have looked like the enemy had won. But here's what we see. Martyrs who so love Jesus that they will speak his name to the ends of the earth and even if it costs them their life, they will lay their life down in brokenness, in weakness and dependence and the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords will worship them or will, will usher them into the place where they will worship him forever. And God alone gets the glory. You know how we win? It's not by our strength. It's by our weakness. Let me ask you a question. So we talk about spiritual warfare and prayer. I want you to think about the way you pray. I'm going to ask our band to come and prepare to play softly behind us. And we're going to pray in just a minute. I want you to think about your prayer life. Do you pray reactively? Does your prayer life look like this? Something happens and then you pray. Somebody has a need and then you pray. You climb the mountain as far as you can climb it and then you pray. You go through the valley as far as you can go and then you pray. You're probably too strong. You can probably do too much in your own ability. And we will never threaten the enemy as long as we operate in our own strength. 
I want to challenge you today to pray a, a scary prayer. And that is, Lord, make me weak. And do what you must, God, in my life to bring me to the place where I'm David, the shepherd boy again. And God, if that means that you got to put me in a battle, give me faith. Some of you are in the battle because God wants to weaken you. I want to challenge you to pray, Lord, please teach me. And Lord, if there's any strength in me at all, let it be your strength, not mine. What's God teaching you today? I'm going to ask us, I'm going to lead us in just a brief prayer. But I want you at your tables to pray. I want you to talk with those right around you. Join together, pray. The appropriate time our band is going to lead us in a, a final closing song. And I invite you to join with them uh, as they sing at that time. Let me pray for us. And then please at your tables, pray as God leads you to pray. Father, thank you that you love us. Thank you that you love us so much that you do what you must to keep us weak, that you might be our warrior and the nations might know of your glory. Lord, bring us to the end of ourselves. Thank you, Lord, that we face no battles that you have not already won. Thank you that the armor we wear is your armor. Thank you you have a purpose in the battle. Thank you that your son's praying for us even as we pray and the spirit picks up our praying. Thank you, God, for victory in weakness. In Christ's name.